So we are here tonight to listen to Mike Pineson for his new book, Spying on Whales, the past, present, and future of Earth's most awesome creatures. Pineson is a paleontologist and reading whale bones is what I do, quote unquote. These bones have told some amazing stories. Whales outweigh dinosaurs and are the largest creatures ever to have lived on Earth, and their songs can travel some 900 miles underwater. But while we know whales descended from four-legged land-dwelling animals the size of a dog, we don't know when and how they developed their tremendous sizes, what's to stop them from getting still larger, or if they can adapt to climate change. The curator of fossil marine mammals at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, Pineson takes us through the collection, the largest in the world, with the attendant lessons on whale anatomy, feeding habits, and migratory range, as well as field trips to Panama, Alaska, and a whaling station west of Iceland. Please help me welcome him to Politics and Prose. Great. Thanks, Liz. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I will do a reading from the book, but I think probably the most appropriate thing to do is to give people some context for why I would write a book about whales. And um, probably, I don't know, let's see, let's get a, a show of hands. How many people have actually seen a living whale in this room? Wow. Okay. Okay. So we have a biased audience already. Um, <laughs> You know, um, okay, okay. Um, I'm sure you've, you've had this experience when you encounter whales that, um, for one, the scale of that animal is something that we don't usually encounter in daily life. Uh, they're very large animals. And they also are otherworldly. They're living in marine environments. Uh, some of them live in rivers, but most of them live in the oceans. And that aspect of their lives, the fact that they live 99% of their lives underwater means that they're inaccessible to most of our tools of investigation. And I'm thinking about tools like uh, a basic camera or even a drone in the sky. We're not able to know about whales in a very direct way, and that makes them mysterious. So I think that mystery of whales is something that's captivated people for thousands of years. And the really interesting aspect about whales is we've had this very uh, strange interaction with them through time. We've hunted them, yet we write them into our mythologies. We extol them, yet sometimes we hunt them for their oil and for their meat. So it's a very complex, long history of interacting with whales. That frames a lot of the discussion in the book. And actually, in one of the opening prologue of the book, I use the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft, which, uh, if anybody's read the book or knows about this, what do those golden disks contain? Do people know? This is whale song, right? So why would we put whale song on interstellar spacecraft? That's a, that's, that's a zeitgeist from the 1970s that we would think that whales are so otherworldly that putting them into the long list of human greetings, not into the category of music or songs of the natural world, but into the greetings section of the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 spacecraft, that is our, that's a snapshot of our interactions with them that's been memorialized really for effectively eternity because those spacecraft are now outside of the solar system. I think that's a very, un, that, that really frames this extremely unusual aspect of how we interact and how we think about these animals. So in this book, Spine on Whales, I wanted to talk about how we interact with them, past, present, and future. So past, by past, I'm a paleontologist, so millions of years is something that's very casual for me. I, I have no problem with talking about hundreds of millions of years, tens of millions of years. Uh, to be honest, that's something that's really outside of the scope of daily human experience. I can really barely wrap my mind around 100 years. But yet on a daily basis, I talk about millions of years like it's no big deal. And the reason for that is because we do have a direct record of their evolutionary history. So this is from fossils, and this is from a lot of work, not just my own work, but uh, many of my colleagues, of looking at the evolutionary past of whales using the fossil record. And what's cool about fossils, aside from the fact that you have to travel many different places and dig up their bones in uh, remote environments and countries, 
that information that you glean from shards of bone tells us information that we wouldn't otherwise know. And that's really critical because that's a line of evidence that's not really available to us unless you do the hard work of paleontology. So the whole first part of the book is about knowing about their past, knowing about their past from the fossil record. And there's incredible things. The first fact is that whales once lived on land. And um, that's a, a kind of a surprising fact for a lot of people. I see a face here. Looks like you didn't actually think about that before today's talk. But um, they had land ancestors and they had weight bearing limbs and they looked really no different from a domesticated dog, a large dog. So um, in the space of about 10 million years, early in their evolutionary history, they went from animals that lived on land to animals that lived in the sea. How did that happen? That's the kind of question you can only answer from the fossil record. And that's from detailed studies of the early evolutionary history of whales from places that are very geopolitically sensitive, places like India and Pakistan, where we can't really go back and do more field work. But we have a fossil record and we know about these early evolutionary forms. So they document that early transformation in whales. And then today's whales, when we look at them, they fall into two big groups, those that filter feed and those that use echolocation. And both those features, whether you're a filter feeding whale, like a blue whale, or you're an echolocating whale, like a killer whale, those are two innovations that have not happened in the history of life on Earth more than half a dozen times. Echolocation. How many echolocating animals can you name? There's bats. There's tenerec shrews. There's not that many others. Maybe oil birds from South America, but there's not that many other times that echolocation, biological sonar, has evolved in the history of life. Filter feeding. Did any of you eat oysters or clams for dinner? Okay. You would have eaten a filter feeder. But the number of times that's evolved among vertebrate animals is one time, and that's in whales. So these are remarkable evolutionary events that happened after whales went back to the water. And that's information and how that happened. That's kind of the, the big question that we want to know from the fossil record. So that's the first part of the book. The second part of the book is what we can know about these animals today. And the argument I make is that being a paleontologist is actually a very good thing if you want to know about whales today. Why is that? Because we can't know that much about whales. You actually have to be a bit of a detective to understand about whales today. That's because they live most of their lives in a remote, inaccessible way away from, our, away from us. We don't see whales on a daily basis out here. You have to go out and find them. And when you find them, they're mammals, they breathe air, but they're only breathing air that 1% of their lives. The rest of their time is spent underwater. So how you study them and how you are able to ask scientific questions about their lives, that requires clever, creative questions that actually can be able to be answered. Testable hypotheses is what we'd say if we're a scientist. And so the second part of my book is examining how whales, what we know about whales today, and the very specific question of how do they get so big? How do they maintain being so big? And how can we know that? And one of the adventures I take people along with is going to a whaling station in Iceland. Because it turns out if you want to know something about their anatomy, it really helps if you have freshly killed carcasses. And we can go into that in the Q&A about the ethics of whaling, because that is a very serious dimension about how we know about whales. In the 20th century alone, we killed some two to three million whales. And if, on average, those whales are about 50 tons of biomass, that's a significant removal of biomass from the world's oceans. That is kind of like an ecological experiment that we've undertaken without thought to the ramifications. Are we in the 21st century living in a world that is very different in terms of how ocean food webs are structured? We all, maybe some of you ate fish for dinner. If you ate any kind of seafood in any component, you were relying on marine resources that in some ways a whale might have eaten otherwise. And we know that our impacts on the world are significant. And this, this quickly pivots into the third part of the book, which is, what room is there for whales on a planet with seven plus billion humans? That's a big question. And the reason for that is because we are now geologic agents of change on Earth climate systems. The scale and rate of climate change on the planet is approaching what we've seen in the fossil record. So again, this is where being a paleontologist is super helpful. Does anybody know how many, what's the current concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? Round number? 
400 parts per million. And we know this because we've been measuring it off the dock from La Jolla, Scripps Pier, for over 50 years. That's a consistent baseline signal that we know the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It is now consistently above 400 parts per million. When is the last time in Earth history it's been 400 parts per million? Anybody know? Three million years ago. So today's world has its best analogy in the geologic record. That's why we want to be talking to paleontologists to ask them what happened in the past when carbon dioxide concentration was over 400 parts per million. What was the biological response to that world? We're encountering past worlds in human lifetimes. And there's no better example of that, and this is how I open the third part of the book, than the Arctic. The Arctic is a bellwether for climate change. Why? Because it's experiencing the most dramatic consequences of global climate change the most rapidly that we can measure. So summer sea ice is, some, is a word you've probably heard in the media. In the next 10 years, we will probably see summers where there is no sea ice in the Arctic. And so for whales, that's going to be a good thing for most whales. That means more sunlight, more productivity, more food. But that also means more humans. That means the Northwest Passage is going to be ice free. That means that becomes a shipping lane consistently through the summer, longer summers, more shipping. If you're a whale, you stand a high chance of being struck by a ship or oil spills. Some of you may remember the Exxon Valdez oil spill. That was a hugely consequential environmental calamity. Imagine what happens if that, if that kind of event happens, not just in a contained kind of embayment like what it did in Alaska, but if it happens in the Arctic Circle where that oil can just spread wherever. So there's a future for whales where they're living with humans and it's very mixed. Some of them where they're at, under active threat, other times where there seems to be winners from climate change. So gray whales, for example, which undertake these dramatic migrations from Baja to Alaska every year, they migrate some 10,000 miles. We've now found gray whales in the Atlantic. The last time they were in the Atlantic was 400 years ago. Why do we know that? Because of collections downtown right here at the Smithsonian. We have gray whale bones that are 400 years old from the Atlantic. So the past is future. And that's something I really wanted to structure in the book, was this past, present, future, a paleontologist telling you why you should care about whales in the oceans. Um, that's the scope of the book. Um, here, I'm going to do a quick time check to see how we're doing. I think I'm going to do a reading right now. That's OK with everybody. Um, and the reading I selected was from one of the more uh, consequential, for me personally, chapters of the book. All, you know, all the chapters. I love all my chapters, obviously. <laughs> but uh, what I wanted to share was um, a chapter from uh, a really fun, it wasn't fun at the time, but I'll, I'll tell you how it goes here. Um, this is in Chile. This is uh, about a few years ago. After years of planning, correspondence, and false starts, I found myself sweating in the glare of the Atacama sun. I paused from scanning a geologic map of the Caldera Basin spread over the hood of a Toyota pickup and squinted, hoping to catch a glimpse of the people summiting the flat top of a mesa in the distance. The harshness of the white light pinched my vision, split between the patchwork of colors on the map before me and the pale blue dome above my head. I was frustrated, my mind somewhere else. We were late. The students on my field team hadn't reconvened at the agreed to time, and we needed to keep on moving. And um, you know, just as a side note, I'm going to side note a lot of these things. Um, this was hugely frustrating at the time. I'll explain why. Um, <laughs> we followed the whalebone trail to the Atacama, and the trail led us straight into fault lines, many of them. Finding fossils wasn't exactly our problem. Instead, it was their context. We were having a difficult time piecing together the succession of rock layers in which we were finding them. As tectonic processes uplifted ancient seafloors, they also broke them up, like a layer cake dropped on the floor. Consequently, deciphering the specific old to young sequence upon layer of rock was complicated by long vertical fractures that displaced the layers up and down relative to one another. We tend to think of geologic faults, and I'm thinking of like the San Andreas Fault as stretching across hundreds of miles. And that's certainly true for some of them. But they also manifest locally 
in an outcrop that may be no broader than the side of a house. In the caldera basin, faulting sometimes created a jumble of layer of rock rather than a neat stack. With boots on the ground, building a single chronology of rocks meant finding specific places where we could measure the thickness of rock in a repeatable way using a simple geologic tool called a Jacob staff. So Jacob staff is literally a staff, which is graded with centimeter scale increments all the way up and down. Very simple tool. It's like walking around with a yardstick, but we call it a Jacob staff. We would also note the composition, color, and texture of each rock layer. Occasionally, we'd also hammer out a sample of the most promising rocks, usually the ashes, in the hope of finding tiny volcanic grains that would yield precise geologic dates back in the laboratory. Through the slow, exacting work of measuring, describing, and sampling, we hope to pin down actual dates in geologic time for enough layers in the sequence to understand the succession of different species, whales or otherwise, that once lived in the Humboldt Current. Back at the truck, however, I wasn't thinking about geologic maps or envisioning the layers of fossil whales captured through time. Instead, I was thinking about hours wasted, miles away from the air-conditioned convenience and sprawling desk work within my museum's walls. I thought about all the effort and time, coordinating airfares and truck rentals, pushing permits along, accounting for family and professional commitments. As the students crossed, crested the mesa, mesa, I waved at them. What I really wanted to do was slam on the, trunks, on the truck's horn until it was out of air. Carolina Goodstein, my friend and colleague, then finishing her doctoral degree, stood it with me at the truck. You know, you can't just rush people, she leveled, without hesitation, sizing up my agitation like a sibling. Trying to make things go faster here is only going to make them a lot slower. I laughed ever so slightly, but stopped and turned to look at her. Carol's face was dispassionately still, her mountaineering sunglasses reflecting a double vision of my own weary glance. I looked down in frustration and back at the map on the hood and exhaled. When I glanced at her again, she smiled, breaking the tension. Why don't we go see all those whales at Cerro Baena, she offered. I'll call Tuareg to show us around. He and Jim are over there right now. You're not going to believe it. Actually, I thought I had good reason not to believe it, especially if it involved a man who called himself Tuareg. His real name is Mario Suarez, and he's probably the single best fossil finder I've ever known. He demurs when asked, but Mario's self-appointed name is clearly meant to evoke the stoic Berber people of the Sahara, an image he routinely betrayed by losing his cell phone, he's lost more than a dozen, and completely going AWOL when we needed him most, usually found at the nearest bakery. But at the time, we were strictly in his domain, working under his collecting permit, which he held as curator at the local paleontology museum in the town of Caldera. Tuareg had emailed me earlier that year about a place he started to call Cerro Baena, and he said complete whale skeletons had been found, but I had a hard time discerning much from afar. I remembered having seen the site, on a past visit, on a sloping road cut of the Pan American Highway that trenched through a layer cake of orange and tan marine rocks. The only fossils I, I had noted were a smattering of skull bones from a large whale, likely a baleen one. Locals had tried tunneling out the bones unsuccessfully next to a graffiti carved in the sandstone. None too auspicious. Fossil whale skulls are sometimes a jumble of broken bones hard, that hardly make sense at the rock outcrop, but require careful study back at a laboratory. Also, they almost always involve heavy logistics that simply outstripped our time, our resources, and to be frank, my motivation. Caro's suggestion reminded me that it's the, of the whale skull that we had seen together on the side of the road. Although it was only, it was, I was only burdened a little bit by this recollection to a point. If we had more time, maybe we could collect it. But we had to make hard decisions about our use of our available time. We were in the Atacama to understand the evolution of the Humboldt current ecosystem, as read from layers of fossils, dozens of species across time. Doing so offered the chance to find out much more than a single broken up baleen whale skull could ever tell us, constructing, constructing that single column 
from the stacks of rocks across miles of fractured desert terrain was something reasonable and feasible to achieve during a single field season, if not particularly sexy. I was also on the hook to deliver publications out of the work as a foundation for future collaborations. As it turned out, I had no clue how wrong I was about the importance of that broken up skull on the side of the road, nor a hint about the scope that it represented. If I was ambivalent about seeing Tuareg, at least I was buoyed by the thought of reuniting with Jim Parham. Jim is a like-minded scientist, a friend, and a terrific sounding board. His finely tuned bull bullshit detector always checked my field decisions about logistics. Earlier that day, we had split the field team into two to maximize our time. Carol and I took the students to the south. Jim and Tuareg went to Sarabayana in the north. I really didn't think, Jim says, I really don't think we should, be, we should both be in the same truck as Tuareg. I said, I said to Jim at breakfast. Oh, just as a matter of sanity, he assented. When Jim, Caro, and I visited Sarabayana with Tuareg several years later, we referred to its several years earlier, we referred to its location as that road cut next to Playa del Pulpos, taken from the nearest high, uh, highway sign. By late 2010, it had become Sarabayana, literally Whale Hill in Spanish if only because of global geopolitics in this dusty part of, Ata of the Atacama. In the past few decades, Chile's geologic resources have become prized targets for extraction by the mining industry, and accommodating large mining machines has meant widening the road in remote parts of the Pan American Highway. An environmental impact study at Cerebayana concluded that further expansion would likely uncover more fossils. Nevertheless, a road construction company was greenlighted to begin widening the highway. To comply, the company enlisted Tuareg and his Museum for Assistance with Chile's strong natural patrimony laws, ensuring that any fossils would be saved. It was then that Tuareg started sending me clipped emails and shaky video from the site, not adequately conveying the message of what was happening there. Besides, it was Tuareg. It was hard to pull facts from hyperbole. When Caro and I arrived, Tuareg and Jim were pacing about the quarry. Large black felt tarps dotted the desert floor every dozen feet, stretching north and south. I ambled up to Jim. Dude, he said in a low voice, telling me everything I needed to know in a single word. This is not the Playa del Pupos that we saw two years ago. Everyone gathered to follow as Tuareg walk, walked from tarp to tarp, rolling each one backward. My mouth fell open as I absorbed the fact that every tarp covered at least one complete whale skeleton, and sometimes several on top of one another. Every black tarp, dozens spread up and down the roadcut quarry, demarcated a whale skeleton. The sheer density of complete skeletons outstripped everything I thought I knew about how whales get preserved as fossils. The skeletons, some 30 feet long, were almost all complete in a, whale, in a way that fossil whales are hardly ever, nose to tail. Many looked as if the creature had died in place, carefully turned on its back, and then pressed flat over geologic time, like a pressed flower. Skulls were easy to spot, their triangular projections and bowed jaw bones at the end of a trail of brick-like vertebrae. Rib cages collapsed towards twail. Rib, sorry, rib cages collapsed towards tails like gigantic slinkies. In many skeletons, the ribs were still adorned with shoulder blades connected to arms and even finger bones. The fossil whales at this site were jaw-droppingly complete. And it made no sense that there were so many so close together. I couldn't think of any other field site of fossil whales like it. I was stunned. Tuareg gabbed away with a positively gleeful Caro and her students. I walked over to Jim, where he stood at the south end of the quarry, taking photos and rubbing sediment between his fingers. We silently watched the sun slipping over the horizon, evening cloud banks bringing a cool wind. In the distance, a single round peak, El Moro, a weathered mound of igneous rock, capped the view. It's over, Jim said flatly. I looked north and south across the entire quarry more than a football field in length. I knew exactly what he meant. Anything we thought about doing needed to make room 
for this site and the several dozen skeletons that stretch up and down the hill in each direction. Measuring that stratigraphic column across the caldera basin, slotting in all the fossils that we knew already about, deciphering that geologic map full of faults, that all needed to wait. My hours and hours of planning had focused on a sure thing, returning with a bag of rock samples and with notebooks full of makings of promised papers. Entire whale skeletons were not part of that plan, and certainly not dozens of them. I breathed in, anxious and unsure. I was frustrated with myself for not listening to Tuareg more carefully earlier on, paralyzed by the enormity of the scene in front of me. At the same time, part of me recognized that the scope of the site, with its dozens of perfect whale skeletons, was undeniably significant. And I had an open invitation to be one of the first ones to study a place like no else, as far as I knew on the planet. It was vexing and tantalizing. And it was kind of Pandora's box. And we'd just seen it crack open. I know, I said, what are we going to do? You have to read the book to find out. So, um, so I think we're at the Q and A part of the quickly accelerated through the song and dance. Uh, does anybody have any questions about whales, about evolution, about fossils? Could you could you briefly describe the um, geologic occurrences that had the whales there and then how they their fossils were left and sure. so you want to know the answer to the cliffhanger that I <laughs> just real short okay so why were there all those whales at this site in the yeah. Atacama and as it turns out maybe some of you have heard about what's happening in Florida right now do people know in the audience follow Google News there's a red tide event happening along much of the Florida coast and that's a result of a single-celled organism, algae, that's creating toxic poisons that are killing marine life. Sea turtles, dolphins, manatees, fish. It's creating a big problem for humans, too, because those poisons are aerosolized. And people living along the coast, people who have houses in South Florida, find that to be pretty noxious. It's not healthy to be breathing in these poisons. That's a red tide event. That's a result of toxic algal blooms. And this is both a naturally occurring event and a human-caused event. It happens when enough runoff from nearby coastal areas creates the right conditions and the right times for single-celled organisms to create these toxins, algae. These toxic algal blooms happen in certain places in certain times, certainly in the summers. Um, and so we think, based on what we know about the site, based on the skeletons that we ended up 3D digitizing. So the answer to this problem, we didn't have much time to figure it out. Uh, we brought a team of specialists from the Smithsonian who are experts in 3D digitization. And what they did was able to capture the geometric data of the site. So the spread of the skeletons, their anatomical orientation, capture that digitally, bring it back to the lab where we would have more time to study it. And when you look at the arrangement and the clusters of all those bones and skeletons, what it tells you is the whales died more or less instantaneously for a geologist, very rapidly. There wasn't much time for the skeletons to fall apart. And what that tells us is that there was some kind of sudden death mechanism. And it had to have happened, here's, the, here's part of the spoiler, is it had to have happened many times. Because what we found out at Sarabina, it wasn't just one site, it was actually four. Four sites on top of each other each one with fossil whales, each one with other marine life, all perfectly preserved. So if you have a repeated event, you'd like one simple explanation. You'd rather not have four separate explanations. That's not really how science works. We like simple, consistent answers. And we see this phenomenon in the modern world where under certain conditions and certain times, in the right place, we get harmful algal blooms. So the whale skeletons map to what we know about these harmful algal blooms in today's world. This is a bit of going, looking, understanding the past using the present. Now what's cool, seven million years ago in the Atacama of Chile, there certainly were no humans, right? And there certainly were no large land predators that would have pulled those skeletons apart. So what we have with Cere what we had with Cerebiana was, we think, we argued, an example of harmful algal blooms in the past. 
But we had all these very large whale skeletons. And like I was saying with the Florida event, we just have dolphins. There was a whale shark that was also found, a lot of turtles. Why are there not those big whales? The answer to that is because we killed two to three million whales in the 20, 20th century alone. There are not big whales in the world's oceans that much anymore. And so we made a prediction when we wrote our paper about Sarabina. We said, we predict that in the future, you will see a lot more large whale strandings. And two years later, people, um, research collaborators from our field team, were part of a team that reported on a large baleen whale stranding in Patagonia, in Chilean Patagonia, in a remote part that was largely caused by the same mechanism, harmful algal blooms. 300 whales all showed up stranded in Chile. So uh, all these car these were carcasses. They weren't alive. They were already dead. But that scale uh, of death only happens if those populations have recovered to what to some glimpse of what they were before whaling. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I was fascinated by your saying that. Uh, Whales used to live on land yeah. and went to the sea because we're used to the, at least I am, to the idea that uh, the sea wa was the origin of life and right. certain species migrated out of the sea and right. developed. Um, so is this an unusual thing from your uh, perspective of millions of years right. or and why do, would it be because of food or oh. so this is a great question this is a, a why question in science so oh, there's two parts i think to your question mm -hmm. one is the why and whether it's unusual or not yeah. um so the why question <coughs> scientists you know i think everybody is generally inspired and curious by these why questions in science it's kind of like why does the universe exist and scientists actually have a very hard time answering that. And that's because scientists do much better with the how. We can tell you how things work. We can't give you these why answers, why certain events happen. And um, this is one of these examples, and I write about this in the book, where fields like astronomy are very much like paleontology in that these events happened deep in time. For astronomy, billions of years. For somebody like me, millions of years. But that's still... Nobody was around to see these events happen. Yet we know we have evidence that they happen, whether it's pixels of light, if you're an astronomer, or bones that you can hold if you're a paleontologist. That's direct evidence. And you want to know what's going on. Can I address a scientific question about that? So with whales, when we have these four-legged whales that lived on land 50 million years or so, why did they ever go back to the water in the first place? That's, that's your first question. And there's potentially a lot of different reasons why and they're not all mutually exclusive right so one reason might be well there's a lot of predators on land and going back to the water you escape those predators or maybe there's a lot of resources available in the water that are not accessible to your competitors on land these um, evolutionary arms races explain a lot about how evolution works um, those alternatives are not mutually exclusive and they're not really testable at the mm -hmm. current moment so we do a lot better when we ask how questions how did whales transform from living on land to going back to the ocean? And you can walk into the Sant Ocean Hall right now and you can see great examples of these early fossil whales, whales that had four limbs. And you can see that evidence for the early evolutionary history of whales when they had weight-bearing hind limbs. And then 10 million years later, a whale skeleton that doesn't have hind limbs and that has four limbs more paddle-like shaped. This is a great example of evolution over geologic time. And we don't have so many examples of this for many transformations in the history of life. That's what makes whales kind of a textbook example for early evolutionary change. Your second question was about um, threat. Um, how unusual was oh, yeah. this return so, to the... Right. The re so the returns to the sea have happened many times. Mm -hmm. And think about all the other marine mammals you may know about. Mm -hmm. Sea otters, sea cows, sea turtles, penguins. So whether it's a reptile or, so or a bird or a mammal, this return to the water has happened many times in the history of life on Earth in different places and probably for different reasons and in different ways. And so because of that spread across the tree of life, you know, we're talking about birds, reptiles, mammals, um, 
different origins. They're all distantly related to each other. They happen in different ways, but some of them have achieved convergent solutions. And one of my favorite examples has to do with whales. Uh, I mentioned this in the book, the deepest diving whale on record dives nearly three hours on a single breath to a depth of over 9,000 feet. So imagine you want to go out to lunch and you hold one breath for nearly three hours and you're running <laughs> 9,000 feet to go find your food and then come back to the surface. But you do this several times a day. No big deal if you're a whale. Big deal if you're a mammal used to land like us. So it turns out that seals, deep diving seals, have the exact same adaptations to deal with the challenges of diving to depth. And that includes uh, adaptations in their circulatory system, uh, how much oxygen they can pack into their blood cells. Whales and seals, which are separated by 100 million years of evolutionary history, somehow evolved the same deep diving adaptations. That to me is a great example of how evolution works. Selection over time has generated the same solution. So marine mammals are one of these great examples. We want to study these examples when evolution has given us the same answer from different starting points. And that's what's great. So whales are not unique is yeah. kind of the answer to your question. If I could, but the examples you cited are uh, live outside on land a lot more than whales Ooh, that do. is true. And that are they true. coming or going? Or <laughs> Boy, that's between. a great question. So, so seals and sea lions and walruses, they're all pinnipeds. That's kind of the scientific term. They've been living an amphibious life for about 20 million years. So they're, so you might think that seals, sea lions, and walruses are going somewhere, but that's not really how evolution works. You know, we, we kind of think of these trajectories, like everything ends up with us. We're the dominant species on the planet. We're geologic agents of change. But um, you only get that from looking in hindsight, right? So we don't know where they're going. And they've been doing a great job, seals and sea lions, of doing that, living on land, reproducing on land, and then foraging at sea for over 20 million years. And we have actually some of these fossils on display at the Natural History Museum downtown. Thank yeah. you. Uh, this is a continuation, really, of okay. the first good. question, I guess. I almost sat down because no, you good. basically answered my question. So, um, But... Um, we usually think of red tides as sort of nutrient related, nutrient temperature related. So back at the time of this um, catastrophic yeah. uh, loss of uh, a large number of large whales, uh, the question is where did the nutrients come from? So oh. one, of the, one of the possibilities, I guess, and this is really the question, is upwelling there in the coast of... Uh, did you read the book? No. <laughs> okay. So the Andes are some of the most iron rich mountains on the planet. Mm. And iron happens to be a limiting agent for red tides. Right. And that has to do with how that molecule is fixed in these single-celled organisms that allows them to generate these big densities, these aggregations. And once they get, we don't really know these mechanisms well, but we know the byproduct, which is the consequence, which is the, re, with the result being these toxins that they put out into the environment. If we breathe it in, we get sick. And for marine mammals, if they breathe them in or eat them by consequence of the food chain, they get sick too. Eat enough of them, you get poisoned if you're a marine mammal. For whales, for red tides, it's a neurotoxin. It will cause immediate asphyxiation. And it, I mean, the death is just horrible, but it's a sudden death. And so that's, that's the pattern that we see at Sarabana, these perfect whale skeletons. Right. The only way that happens is if they die suddenly and then are washed in to the environment, which I didn't, in the next chapter I explain, is a tidal flat. And this is a tidal flat that persists for several tens of thousands of years. The ultimate source, we argue, of that agency is the Andes and a runoff from the Andes through rivers, ancient rivers that go out to the sea. Mm. And Cerro Baena at the time was a tidal flat that was facing openly mm. to the South Pacific Ocean in a coastal environment right next to the Humboldt Current. And where we have these current systems, yes, there's upwelling. That's right. that, that's mentioned in the chapter. Mm -hmm. That's that's uh, for those who don't know at home who are following. Uh, upwelling is a process by which cold, deep water nutrients are brought up to the surface, which power the productivity of all the marine ecosystems that we rely on for seafood. So if you're eating sardines or tuna or any large predatory fish, you are relying on upwelling to provide you with that dinner. 
Thank you. Sure, no problem. So my question is about um, the 52 Hertz whale. Have oh you my heard goodness. Ah, oh. sure. Yeah, this is a question from left field, but I can handle it. So okay. Go for it. I know. I'm yeah. sorry, but I must ask, uh, what is your theory around it? Do you think it's a, a, another okay. species or do you think it's a deformity sure. of some okay, sort? So this is a good fastball up high. I appreciate it. Um, 52 Hertz whale. So this is a unique solitary whale heard off the West Coast of the United States, uh, yes. off the coast yeah. of California and Oregon. It's been documented over several years, and uh, it's been documented not visually, but acoustically. 52 hertz is the frequency at which we detect its sound. And what's interesting about that is that's not at a frequency you would expect to hear any species of whale, specifically like these lunge-feeding big whales. So it'd be something like a humpback whale or a blue whale. The problem is at 52 hertz, we don't know what it is. And it's been calling out there on the West Coast consistently over time without an answer. So it's a very lonely whale, right? Now, heartstrings are being pulled out here. So, so, um, so 52 hertz, so this has led to the question of who is 52 hertz? And the best guess, because we're only dealing with acoustic data, mm. is it's probably a hybrid. And this is an interesting example of biology in the oceans Occasionally, whales interbreed across species. Their offspring are not always uh, fertile, but they do have these hybrids. And actually, if people have been following the news, at the whaling station in Iceland earlier this summer, they actually harpooned and brought in something that looks like a blue whale fin whale hybrid. So that is probably what 52 hertz is, is a hybrid between blue whales and fin whales. But I don't know, and I don't think anybody really knows, but it's, it's sad. It's a sad story. So, thank you. Sure, thanks for that <laughs> heart-rending moment. <laughs> uh, first of all, thanks for being on Elliot, Elliot in the morning. Otherwise, oh, I, I wouldn't be here on a Friday night. Really? I okay. Wouldn't know about? Okay. You, you didn't hear about the, the hockey stuff. You heard about the. I okay. heard about the hockey okay, stuff good. too. All right. so, okay. Uh, very entertained. Good. And him complaining about you and Jenna the day before. So. Yeah, he was bitter. I don't know. I mean, I think bitter is part of his persona. So. Yeah. Um, uh, so thanks for reaching out to a different audience. Absolutely. Just the Happy to be here. Yeah. Um, my question um, is around, you talking about logistics, got me yeah. thinking. I'm assuming you've got some positive and frustrating examples of the politics, possessiveness, and price of trying to get bones out of wow. a country you just described my daily life I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i'm just curious of a good or bad example oh my goodness okay so here's a good example those fossil whales in chile never left the country because we created digital facsimiles of them that we could bring back to the smithsonian that we studied on a computer screen okay so you can walk into the smithsonian if you go to the curious uh, learning center, which is kind of this um, experiential, uh, uh, informal learning environment called Curious, Q-R-I-U-S. Um, in the auditorium is a 3D, rep 3D print of one of the whales from Sarabayana, and it's printed at full scale. So you can walk along the 23, 24 feet of that skeleton and see what it looked like back when we digitized it. Um, that's a facsimile. It's not the real thing, but it's printed at that scale using 3D printing technology. And so that to me is, uh, I'm really proud of that because that's a really good example of respecting international patrimony laws of a successful international collaboration. And most importantly, that 3D print does three things that we do really well at museums. And I, you know, I'm a little bit biased working at, at the Smithsonian, but I think we do these things pretty well. One is research, that's data. There's information about what that tells us that's scientifically significant. You can, I can, and I talk about this in the book. Two, that is a physical representation that is a museum object. And we actually put a number to it. Numbers are free. We can put as many catalog numbers as we want to them. At the Smithsonian, we have 162 million objects. That's more objects than any other museum on the planet by three magnitudes. The next closest museum, Natural History Museum London, has 60, muse 60 million objects. So the scale of what we have to deal with is immense. But those numbers that you can catalog and put them to, we catalog casts, we catalog the real objects. A facsimile is really no different. And three, so there's collection, so there's research collections, and then communication, telling a story. 
with that 3D print, I can tell any kind of story from it. I can tell you how we scanned it. I can tell you what it means. Uh, a school kid in Kansas can 3D print that on a 3D printer and have their own object for them to handle. So that's really a different thing than what natural, muse natural history museums have been doing for over 150 years, right? And that's what's inspiring to me. But yeah, the bad stories, I don't really want to get into that. I would go next door and tell you about that over beer, but um, Certainly. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Thank you for a very interesting lecture. Yeah. Instead of going back, I wanted to go forward. Ooh, I like and this. at least the, in, the introductory remarks, and maybe you refer to the issue of whether whales might grow bigger. Ooh. And I was wondering whether you're talking about an order of magnitude, slightly wow. larger, and in any event, how that might occur, this and, is, and okay. why. Since this is such favorite. a fun question. Thank you for asking that. So I, um, there's a New York Times essay that I wrote that's kind of an adaptation from this very question, which is, and it's from the whole second part of the book. This is, I feel like that was a plant, but um, uh, the whole second part of the book is that whales tell us about the limits of biology and the limits of life. And that's because they are the largest they are the largest vertebrate animals to have ever evolved on the planet. And that's kind of a crazy idea because I think that casually we kind of think that really big things lived a long time ago. But actually, we are living in the age of giants right now. And that is because the largest vertebrate animals to have ever evolved on the planet, the heaviest ones, dinosaurs were sometimes longer, but they were not as heavy is all the whales that we have today. And that includes blue whales, fin whales, bowhead whales, right whales. Those are all much heavier than the heaviest dinosaurs. So if you're a scientist, you can think of a lot of questions that may be able to be tested using those extremes in body size. And so as it turns out for, let's just take blue whales, for example, they push the limits of all these rules that we know about in physiology, in life history, in ecology. And when we work out the mathematics of how big these animals could get, one of the really interesting an answers that we find from looking at how they're able to feed, to maintain that body size. To maintain body size, you got to feed your face. And if you're a blue whale, you can't actually consume, you can't open your mouth to consume krill, which is what blue whales eat, and successfully close that mouth if you are much larger than 110 feet. And what's remarkable is that corresponds directly to the whaling record. So the largest blue whales that were ever harpooned were 109 feet long. So I think that's the convergence of theory and data in a very real way that tells us about the limits of biology. Um, oh, there you are. So could they get bigger? That's a great question, and we'll have to wait 10 million years to find out the answer. Because evolution happens in funny ways. I mean, this is we, we see how that a blue whale is probably at the limit, pushing the limit of how big a blue whale can be. But we don't know what kind of evolutionary innovation may happen millions of years from now. And that's part of the, the great um, tragedy of being a paleontologist, is you're not going to be around to see what it's going to be like. So, question. Can you tell us something about the uh, present situation of uh, the killing of whales, how, how they can yeah. stand up to all the slaughter, the Japanese sure. and so on? Yeah, so I would And you mentioned whaling stations. Where are they and yeah. how many are they killing? Absolutely. So and the whales even kill each other. Saw it on TV last yeah. week with Richard Attenborough. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, the so, killer whales were killing the baby of a great big whale. Yeah. Nature red in tooth and claw, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're not ready for that, you shouldn't watch TV. But, but how, are the, how um, are the numbers, how could the numbers hold up with right. all that's going on? So I think this dovetails closely with the question of um, will whales make it out of the 21st century? Yeah. We're probably going to have 10 billion people by the end of the 21st century. Uh, oceans will acidify and we'll have higher sea level. So what's the fate of whales? And it's complex. Some will be winners and some will be losers. But I think we know there are clear threats that are related to our the byproducts of civilization. And I'm not worried, actually, personally and and just by empirically by the numbers about whaling. Because yes, two to three million were hunted in the twentieth in the twentieth century, but today no more than a few hundred are killed annually by the whaling countries. And the United States is a whaling country. Just because it doesn't happen in the lower 48 means we kind of forget about it. But there's indigenous peoples, the Arctic, in 
Alaska and in the Canadian Arctic that rely on whale meat. I think like yesterday was the first bowhead hunt in Canada for the season. So these, this is part of their culture, whale meat, and they need it to survive for sustenance. So, um, and there's a whole in, uh, international infrastructure, and it's, it's, I talk about this in the book, the International Whaling Commission, which is not a formal body. It's kind of more uh, an international hunting club is the words I use to describe it. Uh, but that's the legal body that was created after World War II to, to guide how we consume whales. But, but this is my main point, is that the number of whales killed by whaling is minuscule compared to the number of whales killed by the byproducts of civilization. And that includes net entanglement. That includes ship strike. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of whales globally each year. So if you want to save whales, global shipping and global fishing is where you really want to target your efforts, not whaling. And I can explain more, but that's that's the short is it answer. Is in the book? Yeah, it is. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Hi. So forgive me. I feel like this is a trend. Forgive me if I ask something that's in the book. It's fine. I'll just point <laughs> but, to it. Yeah. <laughs> but because um, I haven't read it yet, clearly, but I'm excited to. Um, so in graduate school, I went to a seminar about the Icelandic history with whaling yeah. and um, how it was so important to their history and right. how do how well documented the whaling industry right. is. So as a paleontologist, have there been instances where it's been helpful to fill research gaps with human documentation and with social interactions with whales um, where yeah. the you know hard data doesn't quite yeah. fill those gaps so the way I'll answer that the way I, I will answer that is um, we live on an instrumented planet we're all carrying smartphones in our pockets and what that means is that there's such a boon of information that we can collect about these very mysterious and inaccessible animals and I'll just tell you, between the time of being in graduate school and being a, a bona fide professional, I've seen anecdotal tales that were told to me by my uh, predecessors that were just stories about how whales are. And I've seen those become documented by video, either people on a whale watch or throwing a drone up in the air and capturing those data. That's remarkable. That's a that's something that I, you wouldn't have expected to have happened, certainly not in the years prior to that. But that's technologically driven. That's because we have access to disposable technology that we're not worried about, but is collecting this information all around the world. That's because there's 7 billion of us out there occasionally looking at whales. So, um, so we're able to know things about them that we wouldn't have known before. And I think that's only going to increase in that... It's kind of the whole mission of science, right? To pull away from the unknown and to fill in those gaps. There's still the more, and one of the cool things you find out, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. And we don't even know how many species of whales there are on the planet. Go downtown, I can point out skulls to you of new species of whales that have not yet been named. That's because we just, these are fundamentally mysterious, inaccessible animals. And our ability to capture any information about them is either through salvage, through happenstance, or if somebody's on a kayak and happens to see something weird and record it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thank you. Okay. Does that answer your question? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I think so. I, th okay. I like that you answered that in kind of more of a present and future tense than, cool. than what I was asking, which was past tense, because that's kind of a question I had as well. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, Claire. Hi, Nick. <laughs> um, as a scientist, I'm always interested in fellow scientists and how they write. Um, so my question for you is, how did you decide on your framing of the past, present, and future? And how did you decide on your style for writing this book? So it's very different than a scientific yeah. paper that we write. And then, so did it work for you? And then what would you want to try in the future? Oh, this is a tough question. Thanks, Claire. <laughs> um, uh, so the, I think... Uh, broadly, there's a lot of ways that you could tell stories of scientific discovery, and that's that's that was my main mission in the book was to explain how we figure out things in science in the first place, and specifically for whales, which are captivating and enigmatic and superlative and all those facts that go along with their lives. And you might be captivated by any aspect of those traits, but they kind of don't mean anything um, if you don't have scientific questions. Speaking as a scientist, but you may not want to read about it unless it's in a narrative format, unless you tie it down to stories about 
people. So I kind of, and this is something I probably should have said at the outset, is um, I kind of had a triad about this book. It wasn't just past, present, future. It was people, places, things. And those things could have been species. They could have been specimens. I talk about specific museum specimens in some cases. Um, so the things can be uh, a given species. Killer whales are fascinating for, for a lot of reasons. It could be a species that thing could be a specific museum specimen. I talk about the largest blue whale jawbone ever that's in the Smithsonian's collections. Um, the places, sometimes there are important places to describe and uh, to sketch out in full. Wilhelmina Bay is one of those. Have you been to Antarctica? I can't remember. I actually okay. haven't. Okay. So Wilhelmina Bay is one of those important places and I talk about it in the book in Antarctica uh, because it tells us so much about whale ecology. Um, is just a way to frame what we know about whales today. And then people, because science doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's not just, I mean, I think uh, what I, you know, if you want to talk about broader mission, uh, and we've talked about this, is that um, science is not really a cookbook. It's not like you say one day I'm going to do science and you open up a book and you start at the top and go down. Um, it's a creative process. It's challenging. It's limited. It has a context of geopolitics. So how you go about doing that, um, it does have rules, those rules have to do with peer review, has to have do with evidence that you can hold up and show to the whole world. And I think about that with Cerebiana. So those fossil whales from Cerebiana, anybody can look at. And you can look at them because those 3D models are available for anybody to print, download, manipulate. And so if you don't believe what I've what we said about it, go look yourself. Go measure yourself. See if you can come up with a better explanation. That's kind of how science works. So that's messy and that's not clear and that's very creative. So I wanted to do that in a narrative framework. And that was really uh, what I wanted to do in the book. And I thought chronologic layout was a very convenient way to do that, past, present, future. But yeah, there's probably 18 different ways I could have written the book. Maybe not as well, but um, that's that's what I went for. So we want to try next. Sorry, what? We want to try next. Uh, I think, well, that's a good question. Um, one of the things I'm really impressed about from just the uh, feedback that I've received informally is that a lot of uh, readers of the book turn out to be advanced high schoolers. Mm -hmm. And that is surprising to me because I originally wrote the book with um, kind of an advanced, um, with somebody not in that age group. And so, I, um, but when I think about it longer, I kind of I realized that this is the book that I would have wanted to read when I was an advanced high schooler, that it might inspire me to do science. So um, that was surprising to me. And uh, what that's made me think is that the next book should probably be a kid's book that is targeted at an age group slightly lower than that. Because one of the questions I received is like, this is great for high schoolers. How do I communicate these messages in the book to somebody who's maybe nine years old or 10 years old? And uh, this is a good opportunity. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. There's illustrations with this book. And those illustrations were done by a collaborator who is a former student and now a scientific illustrator, Alex Borsma. And those, these, all the illustrations are done in the same style, lino cut style that were all, were all etched in plastic and then printed using an ink press. And uh, they're all consistent style. Uh, but that was really important. An important aesthetic part of the book is that they communicated a lot of these people, places, things that were mentioned in the book. Thanks. So speaking of the future of whales, yeah. um, one thing that I've heard a lot about is how plastic is oh, affecting yeah. the ocean. Yeah. Do you, we know how, or is it just sort of more experimental? We don't know yet how it's going to affect whales. Yeah. So I would say humans are a giant experiment on the planet in general. Um, Plastics gets a lot of uh, publicity. So Starbucks is going to phase out plastics by 2020, I think, 2023, um, from straws. And um, we don't have a very good grasp on the scope of how much plastic we put out in the ocean. You probably heard about the garbage patch in the middle of the eastern Pacific Ocean. Um, I would say the scale of our effect on the oceans in terms of plastics is vastly underestimated, both in... Geogra geography, just how widespread it is, and its persistence through time. What I mean by that is that plastic degrades like anything else. And we don't have a good handle on how plastic has degraded in different ways. And it is certainly true that 
the fish that you get at the supermarket probably has some degree of plastics in it because this has been an ongoing event for the last 50 or so years on the planet. We don't know. And there's two ways to think about this. We don't know and we shouldn't worry, or we don't know and we should find out. And I fall into the latter group. So I think this is, I think it's great that it's emerging in public awareness, that this is an issue we should think about. And it's like everything else. It's like uh, ozone depletion 30 years ago, out of sight, out of mind. Why should I worry about that? Why should I worry about ozone depletion in Antarctica? Well, that was a great example of successful science diplomacy of nations coming together and coming up with laws that everybody followed to guide how what we should do with CFCs. And the, the scientists involved with that won Nobel Prizes out of it. So I think there's a, you know, it's not just about scientific prestige, it's about the widespread impacts of our species on the planet. And, you know, I'm a human, some of my best friends are humans. So <laughs> I, I, you know, we are. We have to come to grips with the widespread impacts of our daily life that may be far removed from our daily experience. Uh, you know, as a paleontologist, I kind of deal with this. You know, I think about millions of years, and I'm not really tied to the here and now. In some cases, um, plastics is like that. You know, washes down out to the sea. Well, that has a big effect. So I think you've kind of put your finger on a big challenge that we have, and I think it's going to be the next generation that will hopefully figure this out. So, so I have sort of two questions, um, mostly based on what your last two have brought up. Um, the first one is mostly um, what, dr and, and for also forgive me if this is in the book and or like the first minute of the lecture. Um, <laughs> Did you come in late? Because I, 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 I came in a couple, couple minutes. <laughs> okay. My bad. It's okay. My it's bad. okay. It's okay. Um, I'll take a question. <laughs> Um, just what was what was it that brought you into to studying the whales? Ooh. Was it was it a was it an interest you had previously, and that brought you into the paleontology field, or was it a, a uh, you know you were in paleontology and you found this cool thing within the field that you decided to focus on? Yeah, so uh, I haven't said that. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> I do say it in the book, and it's a big spoiler alert. I'm not a whale hugger. I've, I was never really captivated by whales as a kid. Um, but I did like mysteries. I did like problems that needed to be solved. And especially that escapist aspect of any of those problems, whether it was Egyptology, knowing about the pharaohs in ancient Egypt, or cryptozoology. I was really obsessed with Bigfoot for a summer. So um, I think it's for some kids, I actually reread this passage in the book. I'm like, mm -hmm. I would have used the word many, not most children, because not every child is so obsessed with different kinds of fields of knowledge. Uh, but what really got me into whales was that I realized that they were vehicles for understanding bigger questions. Mm. So I, I don't mean to malign people who love whales oh, yeah. in their heart, because that's great. You should love things. That's absolutely a good thing. But um, as a scientist, what I want—I want to know things, and I have bigger questions. And whales have undergone such dramatic transformation in their evolutionary history, and we get their fossils, and we want to know more about it. So that—that—that's attractive. That was attractive to me in graduate school, and uh, I kind of describe a lot of scientific problems informally as these tangled balls of of yarn that you just start pulling on. And you don't really, you know, if you have a tangled ball of yarn, you don't really know how that's going to turn out, right? Mm -hmm. But you just start pulling on it in different ways. And that's part of the creative process of doing science. I think science is one of the most creative disciplines we can engage in. Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it does. And I guess if I'm allowed sort of another half question there, um, this is more just about being in the paleontology field. But yeah. what, do you, what have you ex encountered and what do you think about trying to bring in the next generation of people to the field. I know that with a lot of the academic fields, yeah. there's sort of an issue of the old guard is, is running out yeah. and trying to bring people into these fields, right. you know, get, get people interested and able to participate in, in a meaningful way. Absolutely. Um, uh, this is a great question. So uh, there's barriers of opportunity and access across uh, academia and certainly in science too. And, uh, I've seen this transform in the last few years with the growing awareness that we need to do stuff. We do. We need to take important steps to rectifying these problems. These are structural problems about how people are educated and how people learn. They're not. It's not in a level playing field in any way. Um, how we address that? That's a 
bigger pro I think recognizing the problem is, is the first thing. And then how we address it is more complex. I know in my laboratory at the Smithsonian, um, I have students from all around the world, from all kinds of different economic and social backgrounds. And um, the people who get involved in my laboratory and a lot of the research questions we do, um, the primary thing I look for is a fundamental interest and curiosity and creative spark to understanding how to address these problems. Because there's um, traditional ways that you can study any aspect of marine mammal evolution, uh, but the way to move forward academically is to work on problems and come up with innovative solutions. So um, I think it's a tough one. I, I try, the Smithsonian is not, is an academic institution, but it's also government in some ways. And we we have people of, uh, across the demographic spectrum who participate in so many different ways and contribute to that mission. Um, I don't have a simple answer is what I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, I, I didn't think it to be a simple, an, you know, simple yeah. answer. If it was, we'd be in a lot different state. So I think it's the kind of thing we should talk about more, for sure. And I, and that's, I feel like I have a responsibility to do that. So I yeah. guess I'm doing that right now. No, that, that's uh, good to hear. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. All right, and unfortunately that is our time. So can we get one more round of applause for our <laughs>